Hi guys, in this how to every step video I'm going to show you how to design and size a ported subwoofer enclosure to achieve a really nice sounding overall bass response with optimal gain between 30 to 60 Hz to provide a decent but sensible bass boom. I will use a free enclosure design software called WinISD and show you the whole design process in 11 easy to follow steps. So step 1 Add the subwoofer driver into the WinISD driver database. WinISD is free to download and I have included the link along with full instructions in the description to this video. So here we can see I have WinISD open on the left hand side of the screen. On the right hand side is an Excel table I have created that lists the feel small parameters for the speaker I am going to enter into the WinISD database. We are going to use the Skytronic 8 inch subwoofer model number 902.426. I have used this subwoofer in a previous bass box build and it is really nice sounding for a budget speaker. Details are in the description. The process shown in this video also applies to all other brands of subwoofers. I have listed the TS parameters in the order in which they need to be entered into WinISD so I suggest that you do the same to make the parameter entry easy for you. As you can see you need four columns, parameter, unit, description and parameter value. Important note. I would advise you download the subwoofer datasheet and design your enclosure before buying the subwoofer. This is because you may find a particular speaker may need an enclosure larger than you have space for, e.g. in a car boot, or it simply may not perform well in the type of enclosure you want to use. So in WinISD click New Project and then Add Driver. In the General tab fill in the speaker manufacturer, brand, model and data provided by. Then in the Parameter tab make sure the auto calculate unknowns is ticked. This will mean that as you enter the driver parameters the corresponding unknowns will be calculated for you. The key shows the values in black are not available. As you fill in the known parameters these will appear in green and the auto calculated values will show in blue. So now it is a case of entering in the parameters in the order shown here and make sure the units in WinISD match the units in the spreadsheet. You can click the units in WinISD to toggle through the units until you reach the one you need. You need to enter Xmax, which is maximum linear excursion, PE, which is RMS power handling, number of voice coils, whether the voice coils are wired in series or parallel, MMS, which is diaphragm mass including air load, CMS, which is mechanical compliance of suspension. You will notice that FS, which is the driver resonance frequency, now has a blue calculated value. Then complete by filling RE, which is the DC resistance, SD, which is the cone surface area, QMS, which is the mechanical Q of the driver at FS. It's only the parameters with the green background in the spreadsheet that need to be entered into WinISD. The rest should be auto calculated. As a sanity check, I check all the blue calculated values and compare them against the parameters shown in grey in the spreadsheet, which are also from the speaker datasheet. The parameters should all match. When they match to within one decimal place, I leave as is, otherwise I will overwrite the calculated value to match the spreadsheet value. You will see the advanced parameters tab, but this will be auto calculated as long as you have entered all of the previous parameters in so leave as is. Also the dimensions tab does not need to be filled. We will deal with the speaker dimensions later in the video. So once you are happy with the parameters click save then edit the file name as appropriate and then click save. Step 2. Create the new WinISD project and analyse the frequency response. Click new project. Then select the driver that you have just created, locate the manufacturer then the speaker model then click next. Then click the type of enclosure design you want to go for. You can click on each design and see the picture change to indicate the enclosure type. In this case we are going for a vented i.e. ported enclosure. Then click next. Then choose the alignments you want for your enclosure. I would suggest going for Chebyshev as this produces the flattest frequency response which is a good starting point for your design. Then click next. Now create a project name and description if you want to. Then click next. Now you will see the frequency response of the proposed design by WinISD. In general WinISD proposes a fairly good frequency response but it is now that you tweak the design to achieve the frequency response you were looking for and also the enclosure and vent size and design. This graph is the transfer function magnitude 
which is of the gain in decibels on the vertical axis against the frequency in hertz on the horizontal axis. Essentially, the more gain above the zero decibel line, the more resonance inside the enclosure and therefore the higher the volume the enclosure will achieve for those particular frequencies. The base frequency range is between 20 to 120 Hz, so these are the frequencies you want to aim to achieve a good gain for. Minus 3 dB is where the human ear will notice a drop off for the frequencies below that point and is also known as F3. So ideally you are looking to have a minus 3 dB near to 20 Hz and then a positive gain and a fairly flat response from as close to 20 Hz as possible all the way to 120 Hz. The next steps will show you how to do this. Step 3. Determine tuning frequency. Personally, I like a higher gain between 30 and 60 Hz to get a bit of a bass boom. So this box is designed to have a slight peak between 30 and 60 Hz rather than a complete flat response. Here I have created two projects, both with the same driver. One with the WinISD proposed response curve to act as a baseline and the second is the project that we will optimise to achieve the desired response. We can then compare the two curves during the design process. Notice you can highlight the project and press the colour tab to give the project graphs different colours to make them more distinguishable. Click the box tab, then you will see the tuning frequency proposed by WinISD. In this case, 28.72 Hz. You can see by increasing the tuning frequency to 30 Hz that it increases the gain around the tuning frequency. Then increasing it to 31 and then 35 Hz, it further increases the gain around the tuning frequency. The downside is that the F3 is also increased from approximately 25 to 29 Hz, which means you will miss out on hearing the bass frequencies up until 29 Hz. Hence it is a case of balancing good gain around the tuning frequency, i.e. bass boom frequencies 30 to 60 Hz, while not cutting off lower frequencies, i.e. F3 is as low as possible. You can further see the more we increase the tuning frequency, the more gain is achieved at the tuning frequency but the F3 raises into the 30 to 40 Hz range, so you would lose out on all the base frequencies in the 20 to 30 Hz range, which you don't want, around the 42 Hz range. What I tend to aim for is a 2 dB gain at the tuning frequency and a good gain peak between 30 to 60 Hz, along with a minus 3 dB in the 20 to 30 Hz region. With that, you achieve a nice bass boom, but not too much gain that the other base frequencies are drowned out. So it is a case of starting at a low tuning frequency and working up in increments until you get a nice looking frequency response curve. After playing around you can see that 33 Hz was the optimal tuning frequency I selected because it gives a good gain of 2 dB around the tuning frequency, at least a 1 dB gain between 30 to 60 Hz and an F3 of about 27 Hz which should sound really nice. Step 4. Determine the box volume. In the box tab you can edit the volume and you will see if you reduce the box volume you will reduce the curve gain and conversely if you increase the box volume you will increase the gain peak. If you are constrained by installation volume e.g. in a car boot now is the time to limit the volume if it is set too large. I just tend to tweak the box volume to try to achieve the flattest 2 dB gain curve response between 30 and 60 Hz. As you can see here, 1.8 cubic feet is optimal for this enclosure and desired response. Step 5. Determine the port size. Go to the Signal tab and enter the system input power, which is the RMS power of the speaker, in this case 250 watts. So now is when you need to think about the quantity, size and shape of the port. In this case, I knew the overall enclosure width I wanted and wanted to go for a single slot port so it was just a case of subtracting 2 times the 18mm MDF thickness from the overall enclosure width to calculate the port width. Here is a tip for you. For the rectangular port height, use multiples of the MDF or plywood material thickness you are using to build the enclosure. That way you can use offcuts to separate the port sides during assembly and therefore achieve a completely parallel port. Hence for this port I used multiples of 18mm, starting with 18mm, then 36 then 54 You can see here the port size entered is a square shape, 284mm wide by 18mm high. 
you will notice the port length is calculated by WinISD in order to achieve the tuning frequency. Now we need to check the air velocity in the port, so change the graph to rear port air velocity. You will see the graph is air velocity in meters per second on the vertical axis against frequency in hertz on the horizontal axis. If the highest air velocity is over 17 meters a second, then you will get chuffing in the port which is noise generated by too high an air velocity in the port. If, as in this case, the air velocity is over 17 meters a second for the initial port size, then you need to make the port cross section larger to therefore reduce the air velocity. So here I have added another 18 millimeters to the port height, which equals 36 millimeters. Although the maximum air velocity was reduced, it was still higher than the 17 meters a second threshold, so the port cross section is still too small. I then added another 18 millimeters to the port height to make it 54 mil high, and as you can see, it lowers the air velocity to 15.25 meters a second, meaning no chuffing will occur for this port size. The summary here is the smaller the port cross section, the shorter the port length, and therefore more compact the port, but the higher the air velocities. Also, the higher the tuning frequency, the shorter the port length. After adjusting the port size, always click back to the box tab to check you have not lost your tuning frequency. Also, in the vents tab, you need to check the first port resonance is at least double the tuning frequency. Another way to reduce your port velocity is to reduce the system input power. I always start by sizing the port based on the driver RMS power but if the port cross section or length is too large for my design constraints then I reduce the system input power down to the amplifier RMS power as this is the actual power the driver would see. Step 6. Checking cone excursion. Cone excursion is how far the speaker cone tries to travel at certain frequencies for a given power input. If the cone attempts to travel further than X max, which is the maximum linear excursion, then it will bottom out with too much force and could cause damage to the driver. Select the cone excursion graph. This is cone excursion in millimetres on the vertical axis against frequency in hertz on the horizontal axis. The red line on the graph is X max. If the curve crosses the X max line, then there is a danger of damaging the speaker. As you can see, the curve crosses the X max line at roughly 33 hertz and 36 hertz, and again at 23 hertz. The system input power is currently set at 250 watt because this is the speaker RMS power. However, my amplifier is rated at 200 watt RMS output. So as you can see, I have lowered the input power toward 200 watt and it sufficiently moves the curve below the X max. You will notice, however, that the curve still crosses X max at 22 Hz, but because this is a lower frequency than our driver responds to, i.e. 22 Hz equals minus 15 dB gain, then the driver excursion at this frequency should not be a problem in reality. It should be noted that when a driver curve goes above X max for the actual driver output frequencies, then a suitable filter should be used to protect the speaker. Also note that series resistance is okay to be left at the standard 0.1 ohms. Step 7. Check group delay. Change the graph to group delay. Group delay is the time it takes a speaker and enclosure combination to play an input signal. Group delay should be as low as possible, but anything below 30 milliseconds is acceptable. The group delay graph has time in milliseconds on the vertical axis against frequency in hertz on the horizontal axis. As you can see, the highest group delay for this driver is 28.5 milliseconds, so the design is acceptable as is. Step 8. Theoretical sound pressure level. Click on the SPL graph. As you can see, there is a direct correlation between the gain and the SPL at the same frequencies. Here is where you can see your enclosure design work pay off and see the extra volume at the base frequencies that will create the bass boom that you want. Step 9. Calculate the enclosure and port dimensions. Now you know the enclosure volume and port cross section and length, you can work out the dimensions and design of the enclosure and the port. It is important to note that the port length calculated by WinISD is equal to the port center line length as shown by the dotted line. As you can see here, I have drawn out the cross section of the speaker to aid calculating its volume. The orange color is what is protruding inside the enclosure volume which needs to be subtracted from the box volume. The blue is the free air outside of the inside box perimeter which needs to be added to the box volume. I won't run through the volume calculations but you will need the formula for a truncated cone for the speaker cone itself. See the description to the video for the formula. Here I have drawn out the cross section of the enclosure. By deciding the enclosure width and the port size then the only unknown is the enclosure height. So the internal volume required is equal to 48 times 312 times the internal width of 284 
plus the x dimension times 366 times 284 internal width minus the net subwoofer displacement. So if you rearrange the equation you can determine the x dimension equals 453 millimeters so the overall height is 591 millimeters. Step 10 design the enclosure parts. It is best to have all the pieces the same width sandwiched between the two sides. This is because you can set your circular saw once so that all the pieces will be identical widths so that they all fit flush between the two sides and therefore aid creating an airtight seal that you will need. I would recommend 18mm thick MDF is the best material for subwoofer enclosures due to its high density and stiffness and that it doesn't warp. Otherwise 18mm plywood also works well and can be a good choice if you want to show the wood grain. Obviously you can use a CAD program to design the enclosure but I simply did it on paper to show how you do it by hand. Each piece is coloured individually to make it easier to produce your cutting list. Step 11. Produce the cutting list. First of all make a list of parts that are all the same width. Then it is just a case of totalling up the lengths until they total near to the length of the MDF sheet. As you can see these two are all 284mm wide and this one is 591mm wide. You need to allow for the saw cuts typically 3mm wide per cut. So now you are ready to take your cutting list to a DIY store to get it cut for you or do it yourself. There we go guys, job done. So here is the every step summary. And here is a list of tools and materials required. See our How To Every Step subwoofer build video for how we cut, built, painted and wired up this subwoofer enclosure. We hope you found this video useful. If you did, please like, subscribe and leave comments below. Click above for more How To Every Step videos.